recording. So uh, it's uh, today's seminar uh, has a ex distinguished guest speaker from the University of Edinburgh, Ohad Kamar, an expert on array indices, uh, who is going to talk about this very interesting topic, I believe. So Ohad, the stage yours. Thank you, uh, Andrei. Uh, that's, the, that's the extent of my Slovene. Um, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, you know, array indexes, indexes is, is a little bit, little bit of a joke. This is a talk, a talk about dependent type programming, uh, which has a lot of deep ties to, to foundations of mathematics and so on. Um, and, and this talk is my forage into it. There's, there's, there's a lot more lot bigger experts in the room, including you, Andre. Uh, so so I'll, I'll tell you about um, what I've been doing with my collaborators for the last uh, um, year or so, uh, among other things. Um, it does tie into array indexing and, and, and machine learning, but not, not today. So, so sorry about that, Andre. That will have to come a bit later. Um, OK, so I thought I'll start with demonstrating the problem. OK, so we're talking about dependent type programs. OK, so, so that means the types have values in them. Um, and, and the types depend on values, um, and uh, and we'll see what happens there. So, so the dependencies of the types on values are called indices, and um, I'm going to, sh to show you what I mean by indexing with computations and why what goes wrong when you just do it willy-nilly. Okay, so let's start with with uh, a type for um, uh, bits. So we have zero and one. So in, in Idris, this is Idris two. In Idris, it looks like thing two. In Hagrid, we look, it look, we call the same thing. It has two uh, two inhabitants, zero, uh, uh, sorry, zero and one. Okay, two bits. And I'm defining a mod two function uh, that goes from the naturals into bits, which is just take the the, 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 the parity. Okay, so so Idris two looks very much like Haskell, apart from the fact that the colon has the type assignment that has the right number of columns in it. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. So my audio kind of drops out at, at, at some point. Uh, it's to do with the connection. I could try turning off, turning off the video. If that helps. It's, uh, it's, it's not. Video. It's not that it's turning off. It's just that there is always this clicking in the background. Maybe maxing out. Somehow it's too intense. The mic. What about now? It's worse. Now you. Is it better now? now you yes. Yes. Now it's better or worse? It's the same now. Now we are back to normal. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, I don't, I don't know what to do uh, about that. I'm sorry. Um, there's only one other option. I, I can I can click this. If you, this if you open the, uh, oh. you should be able to adjust the input volume, which. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, there's a menu here that lets me choose, but uh, I, I'm choosing different options, and, and some of them are good. Some and they all doesn't seem to make any difference. Is this not helping? Hello. Oh, I think well, I don't know. It's it's always the same. Maybe we should just go on, unless anybody has any idea what to do. With that. <laughs> Let's see. Does this help? Not really. Not really. Okay. Well, it looks like the camera got disconnected. Ah. Oh dear. This is better. It is better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think I'll also look a bit different now. Okay. Okay. So let's let's go with this, and hopefully it will be okay. Yes. No. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay. Yes. And uh, do interrupt. Uh, do turn on your microphone if you have any questions. Uh, let's keep it interactive. Um, okay. So, so uh, pick, picking up again. Okay, so this is Idris. This is not Haskell. Um, um, I've defined a, 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 
parity function, or two, it takes the remainder, and now I'm defining two, oper uh, two operations on, uh, on bets, addition and multiplication, but I'm defining them in a kind of a silly way, so Andre would, would, would probably see it right away, that it's, it's not a good way to do it, to do it. But that's how I'm doing it, because I want to demonstrate something. So I'm, taking, I'm picking x and y, I'm turning x into a natural number, I'm adding them as natural numbers, and then I'm turning them back into bits. Okay, so, so um, for example, here on this bottom left, I have the, the REPL, so I have the interaction with Idris, and we can evaluate the example 1a. Okay, and we see that it's internally successor of zero. Okay, so it's one. This, this, I'm adding three ones, that's an odd number of ones, so I'm getting uh, one as a parity. Okay, uh, now, the reason why this is a bad way to define it and why someone like, say, James McKenna would, would also turn me off um, is exactly this example 1b. Okay, so I have, I'm con one of the natural numbers that just add zero to an unknown natural number. This is the Idris 2 notation for a whole, okay, an unknown uh, fresh file level. Um, versus doing the same thing, so zero plus a bit, uh, but this time it's a bit. Okay, so let's look at the two components. Okay, on, on the first component, uh, Idris could reduce uh, zero plus nat to nat, but on the right-hand side, it's stuck, right? Because it doesn't know how to turn an unknown bit into a natural number and then continue reduction. Okay, this is exactly why uh, you, you try not to write programs like this uh, if you can help it. And, 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 and the rest of the talk is about what happens if you do want to write programs like this. And, and I have some reason for doing that, but let's just see why it's a bad idea first. Okay, so far so good. Mm -hmm. So now let's, let's start making types that depend on these values. Okay, so I'm defining a type level function, choose, and this is what's nice about dependent types. You can start programming at a type level. Okay, so choose takes a three arguments, an even type and an odd type, and then a bit, whether the type should be given or not, or odd. And uh, if the bit is zero, it's the even type. If, it's, if the bit is one, it's the odd type. Okay, looks like sound is dropping again. Uh, hopefully it will come back. <clears throat> can I do anything about it? I don't know what I can do. No, we can hear you. Can, you hear me? can anyone hear me? Yep. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. So I'm defining alternating lists. So these are lists that have alternating elements of two different types, the even type and the odd type. Okay, and uh, this type has two constructors, nil and cons. Okay, so nil is the empty list. Um, it, st it starts with some. Uh, uh, so, so the, the two other indices I have for, for the alternating list type is what well, in which type do I start? Do I start with the even type or the old type? And then the parity of the length of the list. So, so do I uh, have I got an odd number of, of elements in the list or even number of elements in the list? Okay, and that's enough for me to to, to know what should come next. Okay, so so the empty list can have any starting uh, type, any, any parity, and its length is zero. And consing takes uh, an element, and that element has to be of the right type. Okay, so uh, it has to be of choose even odd start. Okay, for if I have a list, uh, a non empty list that starts with type start, or parity start, then this has to be the first element. And the second element is a, a list of alternating types that starts with the next type and has some parity, and, the, and then the overall parity is one plus parity of the second list. Okay, so let's just see what happens. Uh, you know, in action, I have uh, I have uh, exa this example here. I have a list of alternating between booleans and strings. Uh, it starts with zero, so it starts with a boolean, and, and it's going to be of uh, even length, so it's going to finish with a string. Okay, so so it does type type checking if you uh, fit it in the record, you, you'll get that. Type check, and if you put some uh, something else, if you try to put a boolean here, it's, it's not going to type check. It's going to report an error, which hopefully should come up here. And it'll mark up my, my window setting, but uh, but that's what's going to happen. It is going to churn for a while, and uh, it's, it's taking a while not because this is complicated, because the rest of the file is complicated and it's still not going through it. See, so it's, it's complaining and it's saying something here is, is not right. You define bool and choose uh, a bool string with one. Right, it should be it should be a, a string. Okay, that's the alternating list type. Okay, we've we, we defined it. We can have these alternating lists. And now let's start programming them. That's the problem is going to come up. Okay. And so we define concatenation. So what, what's the type of concatenation? I'm taking 
two alternating lists, and I'm returning another alternating list. And if I start with the start type, one, two, the start parity type, the resulting list is going to start with the same parity. And if the parity of the, and, and the second list has to start where the first list, list left off, yeah, there you go, it is finished type checking the file. Um, and the total parity is the sum of the two parities. Okay, so, so you know, it's fairly natural to write this type, and that's, you know, the strength of, the, of dependent types. It's really nice to be able to write things like that. For example, um, okay, I'm, I'm writing, I'm concatenating the previous example with the world, with the alternating list true and shameless. Okay, and because I have a defined concatenation, uh, oh, I have, it's easy to find uh, later. So I define it later, it does work out how things, things get concatenated. So what we want, the way we want to define concatenation is like this, right? So we're concatenating, we're concatenating the empty list first, then it should be just second list. And if we're concatenating cons of a rest and y, it should be the cons of x and the rest. But that's not going to work out. If we try to type check it, it is just going to complain. And the reason it's going to complain is uh, because I, I did something uh, silly in the previous slide. Okay, and so we'll see the moment Idris will, will start complaining. And it's here it's complaining, saying, I can't see why um, start fin to nat plus zero fin to nat modulo two is equal to start. So this is the normal form of why start plus zero is equal to start. And that's also very standard um, um, in, uh, in, in dependent types. You have to do some proofs in order, in order to, get, uh, to get going. So, so that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, in this, um, in the next slide, so we have to convince Idris that start plus zero equals to start, and all kinds of other equations. Only the way we set things up is um, it's actually quite a lot of work. Okay, so so in in the so what we we'll need to prove, as you as you know, I've kind of done done the legwork up front. I have it prepared in advance. Uh, are four axioms, uh, which which are the axioms for commodity monoid left neutrality. So zero plus x is x, x plus zero is x. Associativity, x plus y plus z is equal to x plus y plus z, and commutativity. Okay, so we have a com so bits um, with addition modulo two uh, is a commodity monoid. But we also need in the proof this extra lemma that follows from the other one, and and that's that's kind of annoying, right? We we not to Idris, we don't have to. Uh, only teach it about quality models. We also have to teach it about all the theorems that follow from them. And, and, and we'll get back to, to, to that point uh, a bit later. Okay, so once we do that, we tell it is okay. Um, Something happened. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, we have to put a bunch of rewriting here. So we have to, to, to first rewrite um, um, according to right neutrality and second according to left neutrality. And, and for the concatenation, we have to do a whole bunch of other rewriting. Okay. And so, so there's really there's, there's, uh, there's two points uh, kind of to take away from this. Um, coming, up and, you know, coming up with this code takes a while because you, you know, you're constantly hitting the type checker. The type checker is, is, is Throwing you errors like we saw, we saw earlier, then you I can't see why this happens, um, and and you, you have to work out what you need to add in order to convince it. And the second part is uh, this bit about this lemma here, um, is uh, not only I have to teach Idris about the model, I have to teach it about uh, a whole bunch of extra stuff, um, like this extra lemma that just follows from the other ones. Okay, and if you're working with a more complicated algebra structure. Uh, you would have to do a lot more work moving parentheses around and so on. Okay, I'm being a bit brief here because uh, my sound because of the technical difficulties. Okay, so so kind of zooming out, there's, there's these two problems uh, that come up when, you, when you're indexing by computations. So one is computations with open term get stuck. Okay, so even zero plus x, which usually just reduces to x, uh, gets stuck uh, in the way what we've seen. And stack computations, like this one, unlike uh, values, so this is an open term, but it's a value, it doesn't compute anymore, they, they just get in the way of unification and type checker that operates by, by unifying values all the time, just get stuck. Okay, here it says, okay, I'm unifying something with S, S of n, so that means I know that the first thing is S. 
here, here it doesn't do any kind of extra computation after that. Uh, so that's the first problem, okay? Um, and so instead of having a type checker work with you, you end up uh, um, fighting with it all the time. Okay, you're kind of saying, I don't see why, I don't see why, I don't see why. And you have to say, no, 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 it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because of this. And the second problem is that uh, um, some equations are more important in theory than other equations. Okay, for example, the axioms for community model. And, uh, but um, for the type checker, it's all the same. We have to show all the equations all the time. Um, and uh, that means a whole bunch of reasoning uh, noise that needs to happen with your code. Okay, so you're trying to program, you're trying to, to get something done in the process convince a type checker that it's uh, safe, and you end up getting more and more and more and more code. This is what Connor McBride calls the green slime, because on his, in his text editor call scheme, it looks like green. Okay, and then you get more and more green slime all over your code base. Okay, and, and Okay, and so the best, the best practice is just avoid it. Okay, if you can avoid it, just not index by computations, index by values. Okay, that means that you might have to find some kind of clever inductive representations for the the, the, the computations you care about, quotient by the equations that you 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 care about. Um, and that takes a while because you, you kind of need to know what your program is going to look like all the way to the end before actually being able to write it, okay? Um, so you need to know exactly the quotient with respect to all the operations you care about and all the equations that you, they're going to satisfy before you even start, start the programming. And even when you do, you still have to sometimes put the variables in the right places. So for example, for some programs, you might want to write 1 plus n. For other programs, you might want to write n plus 1 for whatever reason, and sometimes if you want to write code that requires both of those indices, then you're stuck. So you're going to have to write two kinds of data types, one that's indexed like this, the other one that's indexed like that, and then you have to start converting between those two code bases. So, so um, sometimes, yeah, there is no perfect um, indexing. Okay, so, so you know, my, my argument why I want to program like this is there's a couple of programs, and Andre, that, that ties to uh, how you wanted to introduce me uh, to do with maybe probably programming or machine learning and so on. There's a few programs that, that uh, there's only a few people who, who in the world who can write, and, and, and maybe I'm one of them, but I don't know how to write them in Idris because I don't know uh, how I'm going to uh, uh, get, the, get the, the, the quotients up front without writing the program. So I'll be able to finish, right? We deserve to finish the program so we can refactor it, I think is the slogan. Okay, and, and this is what I'm trying to, to, to do here is, is let's say we, we bite the bullet and we, we start programming with those uh, uh, computations in the index positions. What can we do about it and can we still finish on time uh, and within budget? Um, I, I don't have a, a final answer, this is work in progress, but, but this is the question for today. So far, so good? Yeah, can, can you still hear me? I see people nodding, so that means some, at least someone can hear me. Unless they're just nodding all the time. Okay, um, so so the way I'm, I'm going about it is by combining two ideas. One of them um, is called folding. It's called folding by uh, Colin McBride from his master's thesis with James McKenna and his PhD thesis, but it's actually much older uh, than that. James McKenna told me he's been using it knowingly uh, as early as 91 and, and, and he tells me I should also mention uh, Clark completion and, and profits and, and all kinds of earlier stuff. So, so I'm, I am now and um, I will do some more reference chasing later uh, if I can. But it's an old idea and what, what it ends up doing is improving this kind of dialogue we have with the type checker. Right? The type checker needs to see some equations um, and, and it, it can't and, and, and this is a way of, of helping us talk to the type checker about the equations a bit more um, ergonomically. And the second component is newer. Uh, this has to do with our work on FREX. We did in the context of partial evaluation. I will cover FREX uh, a bit later, but kind of as a, as a sound bite what it is, it's an interface and a specification for equational solvers, algebraic solvers. So, so you have some word problems um, involving uh, monoids or, and, and, and groups and so on, and, and it just discharges them, telling you whether uh, this equation hold or not, okay? And so that's one part of it is the specification, so teaching Idris about uh, algebraic solvers. And the second component in it is the collection of prepackaged solvers. So first, uh, one for cognitive monoids and so on. Um, in previous work, we've done a lot more solvers. This is the work in progress, so I have a solver and a half. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk more about 
that as an idea. And we banging those two ideas together uh, to get some some uh, some traction. But uh, there's a whole lot of other problems that come up, and, and I will get to it uh, later in the talk. Sorry. Okay, so so the way I, I, um, this talk is going to go, I'm going to tell you a bit about folding very quickly, then about Rex. Then uh, we usually have a break at 11, I'm told. So we'll break. And then uh, I have uh, not a lot more about how we evaluate programming like this and some some half-baked or, or, or uh, uh, more um, uh, speculative ideas um, how to try to address those problems, the problems that come up when you start programming like this. So I have a couple of use cases. We can look, uh, we'll look at one of them and, and, and we'll see what problems come up. Uh, when you start program like that. But uh, again, feel free to, to disappear after the break because uh, this is a lot more kind of down the rabbit hole than the first two bits. So far, so good? Yeah, I see some nodding. Thanks. OK, so let's start with folding. OK, so um, ah, this is me forgetting. One comment. So, so folding is, is, is uh, you know, it's, a, it's an idea that Colin McBride wrote down uh, that he got from uh, James McKenna. And uh, like anything with Connor, there has to be a joke. And there is a joke, and we'll get to the joke uh, soon. If you've heard it before, then you'll, you'll, you'll know about the joke. Um, I'm just commenting out all the previous code. Sorry about that. Now firing up Idris. Something happened. It's a happy little talk. Okay, so folding. Um, the idea is very simple. Um, at the type checker expects some some equations to hold, with some constraints to hold between in different values and different indices, and it can't really see it, and so it just starts complaining. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say, tell the, the type checker, we can use any type. Okay, so concretely, in, in the alternating list example, uh, the type for the second argument, which previously was, you have to start at the next parity from where you had where you were before. We say, no, you can start anywhere. Okay, start prime. But then we have to pass as, an, as a second argument, um, a constraint or an equation that says, no, no, you have to start at the next position. Okay, so the joke is any color, so long as it's black, it's a code by Henry Ford about the color of cars. Okay, so, um, and, and on the other side of alternating list, right, you say the parity of the alternating list is any parity, parity prime, but it has to be one plus the parity that, uh, of, the, of the second argument. Okay, so, so, so this, this extra equational argument ends up being uh, a little, giving you the type check a little bit more wiggling, a little more wiggle room uh, for you to have a, a better conversation with the, with the type check. Okay, so this is, this is our implicit argument, which means that we can sometimes get away with not writing them explicitly. And there's two extra wiggles in Idris. The first one is this auto, auto keyword, which means it's right to guess or, or search for the argument uh, for this proof. Okay, in Agda, I think it's called uh, instance arguments. Um, in Haskell, it would be more like type classes. Okay, so it tries to find uh, the thing that would go here to, to um, satisfy the proof somewhat automatically. And the second argument is a multiplicity argument. Okay, so Idris 2 comes with uh, extra annotations. It's, uh, the, it, it's based on uh, Colin McGride's uh, quantitative type theory. And, and Bob Atke, where zero says whatever comes here shouldn't last until runtime. It only stays statically. It only exists at type checking time. So this means that if I have one of those alternating lists at runtime, right? So if I'm moving it around in a data structure, um, this constructor is not going to be not going to have four uh, cells in it. It's only going to have two cells. Okay. So it's only going to have the, the the first element and a pointer to the second element, but it's not going to have any proofs at runtime. These are going to get erased. Okay, that's the uh, 
that's what uh, this zero means. Okay, and Idris keeps you honest, making sure that you never actually use this uh, argument at runtime. And uh, what that means, you know, in practice, is that uh, this style of programming doesn't cost you anything in Idris. In Idris two. Okay, in other languages, it might or might not be able to work out that you can drop this argument. Um, and if it can't, it will stay in runtime, and you're going to be working with bigger lists. Okay, in Idris, you, you will not. So, so um, that's a nice thing about Idris. You, you are able to not pay the price uh, at runtime. Okay, any questions about, about this slide? Okay. So, so that's folding in a, in a nutshell, okay? Um, but, you know, what we've done, we told the type checker, don't you try to prove this equation, okay? So the type checker works less, okay? But uh, someone has to do the work, there's no magic. Same thing happens in, in, in maths, right? You're kind of moving the work around. And, um, and the goal is that the programmer doesn't have to do more work either, right? So we just told the type checker, there's a whole bunch of equations you don't have to solve, okay? And someone has to solve them. How do we make sure that the programmer doesn't have to solve a whole bunch of new equations that they didn't have to solve previously? Okay, so, so what we want is some kind of a, a way that not only let us discharge equations, uh, the equations that come up, uh, also has some guarantee that, that we could in the future, if we have new kinds of algebraic structures uh, that, that come up in programming, we could also potentially be able to discharge those equations wholesale. Okay, so we want it to somehow be general and extensible. Okay, and it helps if it's complete. And this is what Frex brings in the picture, and, and that's, the, that's going to be the next part of the talk, me telling you about Frex and how it works. Um, and I should say, the, the small print, there really is no magic, right? Frex, it, it only does automate those tedious rearranging of terms that you, you do by rewriting, say, according to commutative monoid equations and so on. It is just a solver. Um, and some people, you know, love making the students do it. Uh, I, I won't put any names, but uh, and it is kind of satisfying. It's a bit like playing a video game. You're trying to to get uh, to get the goal to 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 type check. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, we're just kind of moving bits around. You know, we want to our students to think, not just to to calculate. Okay, so so the hope is is uh, this can free us to do more creative activities, <clears throat> and of course the creative activities are going to be other kinds of equational proofs, right? The ones that you know if you're writing it on paper, what you would write down, what you not want to write down in computer is the stuff that you will not write on paper. Okay, so so that's what uh, I'm hoping Trex brings into it, and, and so what we're going to do now is I'm going to look at um, ooh. at uh, Frex in a specific case of a commutative monoid. Okay, so the first thing we have to do when we program with Frex um, is tell it about uh, um, the algebra structure that we care about. Okay, so here we're looking at fin2 bits, <clears throat> and we're saying we it's a monoid. Okay, so to show that it's a, it's a commutative monoid, uh, we need to show two things. This, this, this is the type. It's a model. It's a, it's a model of the theory of quantum monoids. <clears throat> and we have to construct two things. We have to construct an algebra structure. So that means uh, we have a nullary operation, zero, and a binary operation, plus. Okay, and this is the zero bit is the zero, and the plus we define in the beginning and is the, the binary operation for the commutative monoid structure. And now we can package it up as an algebra for the signature of commutative monoids. And then we need to satisfy the, to validate the equations. Okay, so uh, commutativity, left neutral, right neutral, associative, and we do it by, you know, there's no magic. We're calling the functions we had before. Okay, those four functions, those four axioms that we already proved. Okay, so now we have, a, a, we've taught Idris, like the thing to, as a commutative monoid structure, and now we can call, we can call Frex and say, you now build all the, all the data structures you need in order to solve equations involving commutative monoids in thing two. Okay, so this is what Frex thing two says. Okay, so what it is, is for every natural number, I can uh, build the free extension of thing two with n unknowns. Okay, and we'll see that in a second. Okay, and it's implemented by calling the library function simonoids.frex.frex, uh, giving this uh, commodity monoid structure and then the number of, of unknowns, number of variables in the, in the terms we're interested in. Okay, so it's a bit of a boss right now. Um, I'll be, we'll be working on, on making it thicker, but, but I'm just trying to show uh, you know, what it actually looks like now. 
So far, so good. So can you explain the slashes in the definitions, like just a little bit of syntax, how to read, like, how do I read ops? Yeah. Ops, say ops, it's shorter. OK, excellent. Thanks. So, so these are uh, it's slanted because of the the, the font, but it's it's just vertical. Well, wow. um, so this is uh, this is called a view. Uh, James McKinnon is here, so you know James came up with it. Um, and so what we're saying is we kind of we have a, we're having a case split, okay, uh, on needing an operation and an environment for that operation, and we're saying uh, case split on this extra uh, uh, this result of this extra computation. Uh, which is the, this, the result of which op, and and what this which op does is it has like a, a, a more abstract representation of this operation. So this operation is just going to be like a, a, an index of it's the first operation in the signature, or the second operation in the signature. That's not very abstract or readable. Uh, what I'm defining here is a view that tells me the first operation is called zero, the second operation is called plus, and now by matching on the second argument, Idris now knows which index to choose, and the programmer knows that this is zero or plus. And so this is what's happening. Okay, uh, in Agda you might put dot dot dot, and in this one you can also put dot 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 here um, as well. But but I actually also want the environment. You see, so the environment in the first case has zero arguments, in the second case has two arguments. So, so I kind of want to take advantage of that fact. Okay, thank you. Um, also, can I answer your question? In the chat, one of the two James McKinnons is saying that Connor came up with this stuff. Oh, I see. Okay, well, um, I think. Prakash Panangadan once said that you, you, it's not useful to break down contributions of single papers. Uh, so I am not, but James can do that. And um, so, so uh, two authors. So, so, so for me, it's it's James and Connor, and it's very humble of James to to attribute it to Connor, and and that's probably true. But I, I'm going to con con continue saying this is uh, uh, James and Connor, and of course history is complicated, um, and and you know I've, I've seen cases where uh, say Gordon. Gordon Plotkin says that uh, uh, my Golden came up with logical relations, the name, and my Golden says Golden came up with logical relations, the name, and we don't know who came up with it, but uh, we, we, we know that it wasn't called like this before, and then it was called like that. So, so that's what we say. Okay, um, can I continue? Any more questions about this slide? Thanks. And the same spiel is happening with uh, the axioms. Um, I would like a slightly better syntax for this, but. but uh, it works for now, and I'm happy to go with it. OK. So now let's see it in action. So, so the second degree, this is also something to do with fold, <coughs> with folding. Um, if we have a single value, um, a single so the alternating list, I want to be able to tell the time checker, just pause before you're telling me I'm doing it wrong. I'm going to give you an equation uh, later. Okay, so, so this cushion takes, the, takes uh, an argument uh, of type star parity and gives back an argument of star prime parity prime. So potentially I can change to any other type, uh, any other indexing. But actually I also have to give equation that star prime is equal to start and parity prime is equal to parity. So I haven't actually changed anything. Okay, so this is another apparatus for, for uh, folding. And of course, the, the way to do it in, in, in Idris is I'm just matching on, on those two proofs. Refill, the type checker sees that star prime and star are the same. And so I can actually give back the argument I'm giving. This is how it works. And if you still, if you were doing something else, you would be using some rewriting to convince the type checker to do that. <coughs> right, right, rewriting or transporting, you know, depending on your flavor of, um, of uh, type theory. Okay, so, so now I'm defining uh, concatenation again using folding. So, um, um, the the second the second list has the constraint on when I start, and the return type of concatenation has a constraint about uh, the parity, okay, and then I have to give those arguments. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I'm making it partial because the definition for the inductive case is on the next slide. So, so I'm going to keep it partial for now. I'm going to make it total in a bit. So Idris has partial functions. It's, it's perfectly happy to, to compute with this. Semantically, it's very interesting to, to try to model what's happening on the hood because uh, the function spaces in Idris uh, somehow are both total and partial at the same time. And so I know Andre likes to think about uh, that kind of problem, um, but uh, um, I'm just going to ignore it for now. Okay, so now it's, it's all type checked, <clears throat> and we can look at the base case. Okay, so what are we doing in the in the base case? We want to say uh, if I have an empty list, and wise, its concatenation is wise. 
Okay, so I have to bring in all this extra stuff into scope so I can do my proofs. And I'm going to talk about all this extra noise a bit later. Um, but uh, we can see this is empty list concatenate with Ys. It's going to be just Ys. And I'm telling it, OK, cushion it using this folding technique. And now there's two, there's several equations I need to prove. They end up being the monoid axioms, the commutative monoid axiom, right neutral and left neutral. But I'm just calling Frex here. So this is me demonstrating how Frex work. Okay, so the type checker, if I, if I put a hole here, I'll do it in the next slide. <clears throat> Actually, I will start firing up the next slide so we can see it. Okay. So I'm calling I'm calling Frex here, and the way I'm calling it is this function we call Frexify. Uh, um, um, which takes three arguments. It takes four arguments, but, but three you know, explicit ones. The first one is the the Frex, the free extension representation that we constructed earlier. So we said we can we can freely extend thing two with an arbitrary number of, of variables. And in this case, we only need one. Okay, so we're only extending one variable called start. And then uh, what we're going to need is to show the equation between this variable var zero. It has to equal var zero plus the constant zero. So var says which number of variable, uh, star says a constant in this algebra. So it's x equals x plus 0. OK, and, and, and we call that, and, and, and Frex just works out that this is fine. OK, and that's because there's a hidden argument here that I'll show in the next slide. Similarly here, we're saying uh, 0 plus x equals x. OK, and I'm, I'm substituting for x parity right, and you can also see that it's equal. OK, so, so now any equation that follows from the commutative monoid Axioms uh, is automatically discharged. That's what the solver is for. Okay, we we'll discuss exactly what guarantees Frex gives you. Okay, and, and the inductive step is more of the same. Um, oh, I should have left a hole here. So I'm going to put a hole here. Okay, I've I've coded it up in a way that might be a bit clearer. So so here I'm looking at the concatenation of uh, a non-empty list, x cons x's, together with y's, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff I brought into context that I'm putting on the right. Okay, and so yeah, I'm saying the forward parity has to be referral, so it actually does a unification behind the, the scenes, and I'm bringing in this, the parity right variable, and the start variable, and the parity variable, and so on. Okay, and now uh, when I, you know, when I'm trying to, to say, okay, the concatenation of x cons x's with y's is x cons X is concatenated with Y's. Then, it, then the, what Ferding enables me to do is, is have a look at those equations, and the type checker tells me I need to prove this equation and that equation. And this equation is ends up being um, ends up being um, the variable zero plus one plus the variable one. So it's start plus zero plus parity is equal to start plus zero or that plus parity, which of course Okay, so then I'm calling Frex on it, and Frex tells me, okay, in order to prove this, you need to convince me that this, this equation holds. 1, 1, 1 is equal to 1, 1, 1. Okay, and, and Frex can automatically look, find that, find, find that proof, so you can find that proof automatically, which is just referral, and when you do, it's happy, and under the, under the hood, um, Frex does all the heavy work of, of making, making this proof. Uh, um, make this term type check. Okay, so this was very kind of the, an applied demo. Okay, the, the point of this talk is, to, is to, to explain what happens behind the scene and how it works. Okay, so so that's what I'm going to do next. Okay, so it's going to be a bit more theoretical. It's going to be a bunch of green slides because all of it's going to be just comments. Um, but maybe Alex will be happy about this because it's going to be some community diagrams. Any questions on this slide so far, though? Okay. So we're going a bit more theoretical, but we're going to state concrete commutative monoids first, and then we're going to generalize to arbitrary algebra, universal algebra, and, and then demonstrate how it works for commutative monoids. So that's going to be four or five slides like this. If if you uh, if that's not your cup of tea, then you can go and make a cup of tea and come back um, and, and at the end of it. But uh, um, I encourage you to, to stick around in the process, which is the point. <clears throat> okay, so so what happens under the hood? 
Frex is looking for a proof that uh, 1, 1, 1 is equal to 1, 1, 1, 1. And, and, and this is uh, the, both the left hand side and the right hand side are uh, a concrete representation of a polynomial, okay, involving x, two variables, x and y. And this, in this case, the polynomial is 1 plus 1 times x plus 1 times y. Okay, and it's, and it's clear uh, that I can rewrite any term involving uh, uh, concrete values from a quantitative monoid and unknown variables in this form. Okay, and this is what's really happening uh, under the hood. And, 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 and what, I've, what we've done with, with the commutative monoid Frex, Frexlet, is uh, teach Idris how to extract from, 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 from this proof a proof that uh, uh, anything you sub substitute for x and, and y will satisfy this equation, so long as it's a commutative monoid. <clears throat> Okay, so, so in general, okay, what is a Frex? Well, it's a free extension. It is a definition. If I have a commutative monoid A, so that means I have some carrier type and then a zero operation and a plus operation, its free extension by uh, a finite number of numbers is uh, another commutative monoid, okay? But this time the carrier is a pair of the carrier of the algebra you started with and a vector of n numbers, okay? Here it's you know, we had bets, so it's either zero or one. So that's the first argument. And the second argument is a vector, in this case, of two uh, natural numbers, okay, which represent the coefficients, okay, for the variables. Okay, so so this is what you know in general what happens if I have a concrete value in the in the in the commutative monoid and then some tuple of n natural numbers that that represents the polynomial a plus k one times x one and so on. Okay, and this has the pointwise commutative monoid structure. This is a maths department, so I don't think I, I need to spell this out. But but uh, is it okay if I rush to it? Mm. Okay, I'm just going to go through it quickly. Um, the zero element is just zeros everywhere because it represents zero plus zero times x one plus dot 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 plus zero times x n. <clears throat> and if I have two of those things, I just need to add them component wise. Right? I add the commutative monoid concrete arguments. Uh, in the first position, and then for each variable, I'm adding uh, its coefficients. And because it's a commutative monoid, I can just rearrange the terms enough to, to, to make this work. This is one of the ex first exercises we give linear algebra students to do, um, more or less. <clears throat> okay, so let's generalize. That's concretely what's happening. Any questions on this? I have a question. Yeah, please, please. Um, does Frex use the axiom K behind the scenes? So know. yeah, Idris, uh, Idris has a, a dependent pattern matching, so it's, it's all using uh, that behind the scene, but it's not essential. Um, you, you, you could do a bit more work and, and do it uh, with rewriting. And um, if, if, if you go and look at the source code, uh, okay. I, would, I would say it, it's all. Okay, thank you. I want to say it's obvious, but but it's not obvious because you know with this kind of thing you kind of have to demonstrate it, right? But but uh, uh, the program I want to write is an Idris program because well because what I want to do with it, so I'm doing an Idris. But but I, I expect this technique to to uh, to port to other systems because people have been writing uh, solvers in other systems. You know, Coq has a semi solver, right? And it doesn't have K, and then Agda has some semi uh, solvers and and and, and the monoid solvers. So so. Uh, that's not essential. It's a shortcut I'm taking. Okay, thanks. And uh, but continuing a bit on that, uh, if you port uh, uh, Frex to other systems, and I'm interested in, in porting it to other systems, I expect that some things become easier in, in each system, and some things become harder. And there's a whole trade off of how it becomes more usable in that ecosystem. Um, and, and I'm not talking at all about that right now. And currently, it's all a bit muddled with interest. And, and so, so some things will become really nice, uh, uh, say in Coq, because you have tactics, right? In Agda, you have already have a big, huge library that you, didn't, you don't have for Idris. Um, and there's all kinds of other stuff you have in Agda, like uh, quite extensive ETA, ETA laws that Idris doesn't have uh, to do with records that, you, that give you extra juice. Uh, the Agda also has rewrites and so on. There's, each system becomes a bit different. And, and so I'm expecting some things could look really cool in other system. And, and so on. Thanks. Any other question? Okay. 
if it comes up, please please do interrupt. Okay, so so uh, so what's the general situation again about, about uh, free extensions? <clears throat> so we have some uh, some theory. In this case, I'm only talking about universal algebra, single sorted universal algebra. So I have a signature and some axioms, a presentation, call it T. And I have an algebra for that for that theory, a model for that theory. So that means it's uh, okay. It just it just um, it is a pair of a carrier and some structure. That's how and, and proof that it satisfies the equations. That's implicitly okay. And then I have some some x, some type. I'm talking about the free extension of the algebra by x. Okay, that's the type of the definition of what a free extension is. Okay. So the input type, the parameters for the definition is an algebra. And a, and a type, and then the free extension of the algebra by the type is another algebra. Okay, so it has a carrier, which we call U A X, um, and it has a, an algebra structure and satisfying the equations, together with two extra pieces of structure. Okay, it has a, a, a T-homomorphism from the original algebra A into the, the free extension algebra. Um, and uh, it has a viable function, which is just a, a, just a function from x to the carrier. Okay, so it has these two components. And the, this, three, this triple has to be universal in the sense that if I have any other algebra of b, any other homomorphism from a to b, and any uh, other function from x to the carrier, then there exists a unique uh, homomorphism, hm, from the free extension to b. Okay, that makes the two cumulative diagrams commute. We're going to look at those diagrams quickly in the next slide. And this is, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's no rocket science here. This is the co-product. This is the co-product of the algebra A with the free algebra of Rex. And, um, and this is just spelling that uh, universal probability out uh, in excruciating detail. Okay, but um, I'm not trying to hide anything abstract here, but when you unpack it, this is what you get. So, so let's look at it concretely. In the next slide with commodity monoids. <clears throat> okay, so what happened with commodity monoids? Remember the, the, the free extension was the algebra structure of a pair of things, an element of the algebra by a triple of natural numbers, or a pair of natural numbers, or in general, a pair of natural numbers. Okay, and, and the first homomorphism, the one that goes from the algebra to the free extension, takes an A and just sticks zero everywhere else. Okay, so it represents A plus zero times X, zero times Y plus zero times Z. Okay, and the, the map, uh, the, the unique homomorphism from that into any other algebra is going to map it to h of a plus zero times x plus zero times y plus zero. Zoom expert is the next best thing to Oha, it seems. Because it looks like Oha dropped out. Ah. There he is. His camera is off. Hello? Yes, you dropped out. Zoom decided. I dropped out. Egbert was the, your best substitute. So. <laughs> OK, so let's see what's happening. I can. You, you need to make me a host again. Yes. There you go. Uh, so the question is, did, I, did they speak into the void for, for, for a few minutes oh, or not? Oh, just a couple, just like five seconds. So five seconds, OK. Yeah, yeah. You were somewhere around in general here. In general, OK. So uh, have you seen this slide already? Yes, we have, yes. You have, OK. We may have, we may have okay, been so, to the end of it. OK. And so, so. So backtracking, okay. So so the, the the structure of the free extension for commutative monoids, <clears throat> the homomorphism bit that, that sends an element in the algebra to uh, to the free extension sends uh, the first component, first the, the concrete element A into uh, the pair of that element A, and then zeros everywhere else. A variable, say this is the variable y, so out of x, y, z, so it's the variable number one, gets sent into zero plus zero times x plus one times y plus zero times z. <clears throat> okay, and in general, the the, the map, the homomorphism from the free extension, uh, which in general looks like concrete A and then three coefficients k l and n, uh, will send uh, will send it to 
h of a plus k times x plus l times y plus m times z, okay, where x, y, z is the image of this environment function at 0, 1, and 2. Okay, so, and, and you can check that it commutes because of the uh, commutative monoid uh, equations. Huh, right. Okay. Um, uh, Egbert, I'm not ignoring you. I will answer your question in a couple of slides. <clears throat> Okay, so this is what, what, what why those equations hold for the for the free extension for commutative monoids, but you know with Frederick in general. Any questions on this slide? I have a question actually. Why is yes, Z equal two at the end? Here? Yes. So uh, I never actually said what X, Y, and Z here. So so um, I'm saying. Uh, uh, I'm defining Z to be the image of environment on the fin two, fin three element two. Uh, so, I just so, say the Bruyne indices. I can just take the Bruyne indices. I can write K times N zero plus L times N one plus M times uh, N two. Uh, I was just hoping to kind of make it a little bit more abstract here. Uh, um, okay. But uh, good. Okay. Any other question? Good, good, good. I mean, it's good to, to keep everyone on board. Okay. So, so why does this even work? Um, I think some people in the room already can already see it, but uh, um, not everyone. So, so the general, you know, general theorem here. The free extension, this is this is in sets, this is not in type theory. <clears throat> the free extension of an algebra by a set X is isomorphic to uh, taking the term signature of uh, the language of the algebra uh, over what? Over the concrete elements of the algebra and the variables X, okay, so either this or that, uh, with the axioms for the theory and the evaluation axioms. So what's the evaluation axioms? The evaluation axioms are these. Uh, take for every function symbol in the signature f in every function symbol, applying f to concrete elements, so a1 to an, is the same thing as calculating, evaluating f on those concrete elements and sticking in that concrete element. Okay, so it's kind of an evaluation uh, equation, and I'm sticking a whole bunch of them, one for every uh, uh, every um, symbol in the signature and every concrete tuple of elements. Um, but that, well, that's, what, that's what makes um, this uh, free extension of A by X a kind of a universal property or specification for normalization by evaluation algorithm for A modulo the axioms in the theory. Okay, so, so if we can have it for all algebras, okay, that means we've come up with a normalization by evaluation algorithm, right, for uh, all algebras. If we can have it for a class of algebras, we can. We have an NB for a class of algebras, and we know that dependent type theory is used in normalization by relation algorithms in order to, to, to help type checking. So it's not so surprising um, having that having a framework uh, for, for, for NBE, for normalization by relation, um, lets us make type checking a bit easier. Okay, so let's do it concretely. Uh, uh, sorry, before that. Because of this, we can we can write a Frexify function. So now I'm telling you how, how you basically write a Frexify function. So Frexify with some free extension A, um, extended by some by three, say three variables whose concrete elements are gonna be or whose elements are gonna be substituted by A, B, and C of some left hand side equals right hand side. And remember there's an implicit argument proof here. Okay, how do how does that get implemented? Well, <clears throat> we're evaluating this. Uh, equations left hand side equals right hand side in the free extension. Okay, for example, x plus one plus y. Okay, I'm evaluating the right hand side in the free extension, one plus x plus y. What I'm getting at both sides is the same Frex element, one comma one one. Okay, and this proof just uh, you know tells tells Idris, look, these two are really equal. Okay, so so the left hand side is equal to the right hand side in the free extension. Okay, now I have a, this unique uh, homomorphism of extending the identity function uh, with the envi this environment. You see, this triple represents an environment. Okay, a function assigning to uh, 0, A, 1, B, 2, C. Okay, um, 
So I have a unique homomorphism from here to here. Now, because these are equal in the free extension, the, the images have to be equal. Okay, so evaluating this term, and uh, this left-hand side term in the environment ABC is giving me something that's equal to evaluating this right-hand side term in the same environment. But when you do that, you get A plus one plus B on the left and one plus A plus B on the right. So they're actually equal. Okay, so this is why Frexify works. Okay, so, so you know, writing this down in Elus is a bit more involved, but abstractly, this is what's happening. Question? Yep. Uh, how should I be reading? So A in square bracket X means the, the freely extended uh, A structure. Uh, and yep. we have these double braces, the, the semantic braces, LHS. How am I reading? How am I supposed to read that? Evaluating a term in an algebra. OK, so this says evaluate LHS. Evaluate the term LHS in the free algebra in the algebra AX. Yes. And then the bottom line is strange because it says what? Evaluate something. If, evaluate the left hand side in A, but then you have some variables there. Yes. You have to stick in uh, through this environment. Oh, so that's right. the environment that I'm evaluating in. Yeah. Yes. So you could probably abstract that away in some sense. If you had an extensional type theory, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. So this is the kind of the last theoretical slide. We're gonna then break. Okay, and and, and we're gonna come back uh, hopefully uh, for for a bit more down the rabbit hole if you want. Okay, and now I can answer uh, Egbert's question as well. Okay, so, so this works for general notion of theory. Okay, and when I say works, I have to be careful here. What does work mean? Okay, so, so what's currently already implemented, what's running inside Frex, uh, there's only just two things that work, uh, simonoid, commutative monoids fully, and I'm currently still writing the, the commutative uh, semi-ring uh, Frexlet free extension. Okay, and that's because of the kind of two sides of a spectrum where commutative monoid is really, really simple. Uh, commutative semi-ring is, is, is a bit more uh, involved, but you can actually discharge interesting equations. Um, uh, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm starting with those two. But in previous work, when we worked on partial evaluation, we did a whole bunch of, 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 of free extensions that run. Okay, um, monoid distributive lattices, abelian and non-abelian groups, uh, F-algebras, and so on. So these, I mean, I'm planning to port these in uh, into Idris, and of course, different different flexes make some assumptions on, on how equality behaves for your notion of, alge of algebra. So, for example, if you're doing semi rings, you kind of want to know that you can decide whether zero is zero or not, whether something is zero or not, uh, in order to, to know whether you, you're hitting zero or not. But, but um, uh, with those assumptions, you can actually get those those algebras, <coughs> those free extensions. Um, what we're working beyond this work, so so definitely not in formalizing Idris, um, and even not even not even yet implemented, is is uh, multi-solid algebras. And because there's some interesting examples you, you can do when you're trying to partially evaluate automata uh, code to doing dealing with automata, and it looks like what you what you end up is getting uh, BD a specification for BDDs as, as kind of a free extension. Uh, for for a more solid uh, class of algebras, <clears throat> so that's uh, something we're currently working on. But in general, I mean, when you have a general enough notion of algebra, the free extension is just uh, so amounts to the coproduct of an algebra with a free algebra. So so you, you could try to repeat this story in very general settings, and I am interested in doing that in in very general settings, specifically parameterized algebraic theories, because I want to see more standard. No, NBE algorithms as satisfying the free extension universal property. Um, but, but you know, to go to that level inside a type theory might be a bit too much right now. Um, but but uh, we're definitely thinking about, about uh, doing that. There's some existing work um, in that space. You kind of need to know how to squint at it uh, to see it. And I'm always happy to, to, to see more of it. Um, um, so, so yeah, references are welcome. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to pause here. The last stage would include type theory itself. Yes, but Egbert, you can do type theory inside type theory. It's just that uh, um, 
Yeah, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, we'll get there. So, so, so I'm gonna put, I'm gonna take more questions now on, on, about everything up to this point. Then we can break for maybe some minutes. You know, the organizers will tell me, and then we can uh, come back for kind of for more down the whole of evaluation of. Uh, making Frex, using Frex for, for, for discharging a whole bunch of equations um, in more than, two, more than two examples and some lessons I, I, I've learned from it, but uh, still a work in progress. Okay, I'll, I'll pause here now. Questions? So I have a question. So you're, you're saying, what the idea that you have here is that when you have this free extension, you are reflecting equality in that free extension, which is uh, which can be nasty into something simpler. For instance, something where you know the normal form or or, or some such, like like the the, the commutative monoid example. Am I thinking right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, correctly. This is a proof by reflection technique. Yes, so, I said it earlier on as well. Okay. So, so what you're saying, um, a little bit more categorically, I think, is this: you have a quotient, so a equalizer, and if you manage to show that this is the co-equalizer of a kernel pair of a morphism that maps into a particularly nice algebra whose equality you can handle, then your method works. Is that too cryptic? Yes, exactly. Not yeah, no, that's exactly exactly what how I got there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Okay. Yes. And so this is going to be sort of a, but it's not that you just need it's it's not that you need that you want to manage just a single algebra. You need to be able to handle free extensions of algebras so that you can deal with free free variables. Right. Yep. But you don't need to map free extensions to free extensions. You can map free extensions to whatever you like. You just need to reflect yep. quality into something reasonable. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Okay, very nice. Okay, so let's, uh, if, if there are other questions, please ask. Otherwise, let's have a break. So we usually have a, a break like on the order of five minutes, something that's enough for people to stretch their legs and make a coffee. So let's, let's come back at 11.25. How's that, everybody? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I'm, I'm going to make some coffee. So I'm just going to mute, but I will leave the camera on.
Yeah, but yours isn't. А что если...
Okay, the coffee makers are back in their office. Okay. Uh, we need to uh, reconnect to uh, Ohad screen, it seems. Yes, I... Oh, is it is it not working? No, I, uh, I, I just put up a coffee break note. Oh, I see, okay. Uh... Okay, we're back. Okay, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so... So welcome back. Um, we stopped just before the evaluation section, right? Or how, how am I uh, kind of saying whether I've made my life easier or harder? Okay, and then the answer is I've made some bits easier and some bits harder. Um, and, and there's a few more things that we need to, to make easier. Okay, so, so to evaluate it, this is still work in progress. Um, I'm using two examples so far. Um, one of them I will not talk about in detail today is uh, Idris's integer library. So Idris uh, compiles down to a whole bunch of backends. One of them uh, um, is uh, uh, Scheme, and that's the kind of the preferred backend. Um, scheme has uh, integer big num numbers primi as primitives, and, uh, and and that means you have unbounded computation. But uh, that's the plus side. The downside is that really none of this computation happens at, at, at uh, uh, type, the type level unless the term is completely closed. Okay, so, so we can look at an example, uh, um, uh, example four. Okay, so I have, uh, I have three plus two plus int. Uh, it's the same situation as we had with, with this modular, modular two uh, computation. It, it just doesn't, doesn't the moment there's, there's an unknown, it just gets stuck, okay? There's nothing fancy happening under, under the hood. And so that means if you want to prove anything about the integers, um, uh, you either have to assume it or you, you kind of assume some evaluation uh, um, um, axioms. And then you have to do a whole bunch of rewriting. But you know, you're not working in Cox. You don't actually have tactics or anything like that. So it's like the worst kind of dependent type theory rewriting uh, out there. Uh, it gets really messy, and so so what I'm what I'm doing there is I'm I, yeah I've assumed a couple of axioms that I'm hoping I could prove um, easily for for a more concrete uh, representation of, of of integers, <clears throat> and then derive all the structure out of it, um, and and there yeah you're using flex all the time you know you're starting you you're showing it's a monoid you're showing it's a commutative monoid and that helps you prove it's it's a semi-ring commutative semi-ring, and then it, that helps you to prove it's an abelian group. Um, and so on. So, so kind of you, 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 you're building up the the frex the frexlets as you go along, uh, and and each frexlet makes it easier for you to 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 prove more complicated equations. So, so that's nice, but it's still in progress. I've not finished, um, and that's one of my motivations for trying to do the the other end of of getting commutative semi-free uh, free extensions. Okay, I'm not going to talk about that anymore unless anyone has any question, um, on that. <clears throat> what I am going to cover is a, a paper by Edwin Brady, James McKenna, and Kevin Hammond, from, uh, which I still haven't fixed. I, and I, I believe it's 2008, not seven. I'm sorry about that. But if it says seven, OK. Either 2007, 2008, there's only one paper with all three co-authors, I believe. So, so that, that uniquely chooses it. Um, and what they've done uh, in that paper is take bits vectors, but index them by natural numbers. Okay, so. Um, so uh, here's the contribution of the paper in two slides. Of course, it has you know, more, more than that. But this is what uh, I'm extracting for the purpose of this talk. <clears throat> um, so they do, you know, two data structures. So the first one is uh, a bit, and the bits are indexed by the natural numbers that they represent. Oh, the better the audio is better without the camera. I can. Oh, the, my camera is off. Okay. Possibly, it's probably a a, a a bandwidth issue. Yeah, so it's fine. Well, we'll just won't see you, but it, we can hear you much better now. Okay, so I'll I'll keep the video off. Um, okay, so so bits are indexed by their value. So the zero bit is indexed by the number zero, and the one bit is indexed by the number one. Okay, and I'm I'm putting these uh, namespaces because I'm at the same time I'm rec I'm recovering those definitions, but also interfacing with the whole formalization that happens in another file. So that's why you're seeing those little namespaces uh, around. Uh, and I'll, I'll make a point of telling you what I'm using the the other version. Okay, but I'm really not hiding anything. 
And the second, now that I have bits, I can talk about bit vectors. <clears throat> so bit vectors have uh, two arguments, the width and the value. Okay, in a bit vector, uh, um, the the empty bit vector, right, it has width zero and it represents the number zero. And if I have a bit representing the number b and a bit vector of width, of width, width representing the number value, then b cons uh, b cons uh, that bit vector is a bit vector of length one plus and uh, b plus twice the value. Okay, so b plus times uh, the val because I'm doing it little endian style. Okay, I'm starting with the least significant bit and going to bigger bits. And I'm kind of cheating that the paper had had both little endian and big endian versions. And the reason I'm, I'm doing uh, I'm doing the little endian version is because I can then use the commutative monoid prex uh, directly. Otherwise, I have to think about powers and multiplication uh, a lot more than, than 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 I have to right now. So, so yeah, there's a, a, a nice section in, in the paper about comparing the two results, the two representations, and connecting them, which uh, uh, I have formalized, but, but uh, I'm not going to talk about more uh, today. And let's just look at an, at an example, right? So here we have a, a bit vector, a six-bit vector, um, representing some value, and that value is a dependent pair. Okay, so then we can see Idris will work out that uh, this 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, little endian style represents uh, oops, Something. Okay. I do not know why it does not work, but oh, because it's uh, it's not exported. That's why. Wow. Uh, public export, and it needs to be. Okay, it will take a while. It represents forty-two, and I, I, I'll, I'll do it later in the slide. I'm sorry about that. As you can see, I am a novice hacker. Okay, but, uh, and then and then um, what what they do in, in that in, in the paper that is that they find a, 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 a carry a carry addition. Okay, so they have a representation for what's a, what's a number carrying a bit. Okay, it has two arguments. <coughs> Again, the width of the of the bit vector it's 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 uh, it's representing and which bit it's it's. Um, in which value it's representing, and a, a num carry has two arguments, a number and a, and a bit carry, okay, and it's representing uh, the value of that number plus two to the power of the width times that bit. Okay, so, so when you have this, this representation, this is what addition works with, right? You're taking two of them and you add them and you carry the bit. Okay, so, so and one of the nice bits in the paper is, it, is that by indexing like this, you, can, you get to derive a whole bunch of properties about bit vector addition from the addition on the natural numbers. Okay, so for example, and here I'm calling the the function from uh, the formalization. So this is working with a with the same representation but in a different file. Okay, so I'm taking two numbers, <coughs> a, a left number and a right number, and, and they have the same bit. And I'm saying adding left and right with a carry bit is the same thing as adding right and left in a carry bit. And what's the proof like? Uh, it's because um, um, when I add the two uh, the two numbers, uh, the value I get at the end is the same value. Okay, so so it, it, it's both uh, uh, um, the left value plus the bit, uh, left value plus right value plus the bit. But it's just that one is one in one order, the one is in the other order. And so long I can convince uh, the type checker that those two natural numbers are the same, I get that the addition is the same. Okay, so I get to reflect back into a complicated low-level representation abstract properties of, of the numbers. Okay, so so um, um, so that's very nice, and and, and you know you, the proof that it's commutative, you can just call the commutative axiom, or you can use Frex. That that's not the point. The point is using Frex in the process of proving this num carry unique folded, right? Uh, um, um, function. Okay, so if you look at the type of num carry unique forward, okay, you see it takes two number uh, that have the value of val x and the value of val y, and then a proof that they represent the same value. Okay, and from that you get that they actually have the same bit vector representation. Okay, that's what's doing all the heavy lifting. Okay, so there's some kind of injectivity um, of of uh, of num carry. So far, so good. 
this is this is um, Edwin and James and Kevin's paper. This is not this is not me at all. The point is uh, reproducing that proof um, in Idris and seeing whether Frex can let you uh, make things a bit simpler than what otherwise would. Uh, yes. So now we, I should be able to say bin example five, and you see that it's a dependent pair of a bit vector zero one zero one zero one representing the value 42. So, so you know, if I have not been pulling your leg. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so some lessons I've learned from, from, from doing this. There's, there's some good, there's some bad, and there's some ugly. There's a lot of ugly. Um, but, uh, um, you know, ugly means an opportunity for programming language uh, research. So, so that's what I'm going to do in the next few slides is, is uh, evaluating concretely what looks bad and pr proposing what we might be able to do to, to make it better. Okay, so the good stuff is that, you know, even though this looks a bit ugly, but um, I'm just going to syntax highlight it. <clears throat> Frex just works the way you expect it, right? So as you're calculating, you, you have some equation, and that equation is this this ugly term is equal to that ugly term, and you just stick it in, and, and, and Frex can work it out. Okay, you, you you know, all the steps in the proof, when on paper you say, we arrange the terms, not even bother writing it down, it just does for you. This is why you have algebraic solvers, and that works as expected. It's great. Okay, I love it. Okay, even though it looks really ugly right now, and, and it's okay. And it, it, I still don't have to move parentheses left and right and, 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 and rearrange things uh, uh, manually, which, which I, I, I don't know. It just makes me feel stupid because the machine should be, should, should be able to do it, and, and, and I don't I, I should never have to do it. Okay, um, so so that's the good bit, and, and as I said, this is what you'd want. Expecting much more is is probably unreasonable, um, but not even getting that would be also unreasonable. Any questions about this? Right, so I took this term and I rearranged it like this. Okay. Bad. Okay. So, what 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 this lets you do? What we're trying to do is to write a dependent type program without having actually done the very long and hard thinking about how we should index it, what should be dependent, and what shouldn't be dependent. Okay. Um, and that can take years because it's hard. Okay. But as a consequences, as a consequence the proofs you have to come up with end up being very dependent. So a lot of the activity that goes in dependent type programming research is working out exactly how to index things in a way that makes the proof manageable. Okay, and because we have not done that lead work, and because my goal is not to do that lead work, right, because I want to be able to first write the program and then refactor it so that it's nice, right, I get some really horrible things. So, so, so in particular here, I get to have to use Kong5, okay, and Kong5 is on the next slide. Okay, that's Kong5, okay? And um, uh, I actually don't know how far Agda goes in defining Kong. I think Agda has Kong1 and Kong2 for sure. I don't know if it probably has Kong3. I don't know if it has Kong5, okay? And and the, once you start writing those Kongs, you can, you see that you 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 know you want it automatically, and, and, and I stole a lot of ideas from from Guillaume Alès. This is a tidy paper from 2019 on how to try to do that in general. Um, but uh, you know, for the purpose of, of the talk and this work, uh, what is Kong N exactly? <laughs> right. So I had a Kong N Egbert, um, but uh, it's not as nice as 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 uh, I would like it to be. So if you want, I can send you a link a bit later. Uh, I um, so Kong N. I didn't mean to ask you to define Kong N. I just want to know what is the idea about this uh, Kong one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, okay. So, so uh, what Kong does? Okay, uh, it takes a it takes a context. Okay, uh, for example, in this in the previous slide, <coughs> the context is uh, um, if you give me a, a, a bit and a value and a number. Of uh, um, of width width of width is constant of that value, and then um, the value the, the bit that that 
number represents, and then a proof that this uh, that val prime, which is another constant, is equal to this. Then uh, I'm giving, going to give you back a a, 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 a num carrying representation that has num as the as the bit vector and carry as the bit. Um, and there's a whole bunch of implicit arguments here that that's happening behind the scene. Okay, so that's the context. Okay, and then I have two um, two such uh, um, values to plug into the context, and I'm saying each corresponding pair of values is the same. Therefore, plugging them into uh, this context give you the same value. So it's a, like kind of a generalized Leibniz or, or generalized uh, congruence uh, uh, relation. Um, okay. So that, that, that answer uh, your question about what, what this is used for and, and what it looks like, okay, is you start having to tell, to tell Idris, I have a telescope, okay, so if a, a, context, a telescope, a dependent type context, right, uh, so I have some A1 and then uh, Z2 depends on, uh, uh, on Z1 and Z3 depends on Z1 and Z2 and Z4 depends on Z1, Z2 and Z3 and Z5 depends on the first four. And it gives us something in this type that depends on all five. Okay, and you want then the proof for congruence five to be generated somehow generically. And this is what uh, Guillaume was working towards there, and, and, and one can do. Uh, but, but it's still a bit too messy. So, so, you know, a bit of a work in progress. And that's why, you know, the easiest thing for, for this is to really just, you know, bite the bullet and write it by hand. Um, but but the, the, the would be a, there is an energy way to, to go about doing this. If you're working in, say, Coq, I think you would just be doing it with some kind of a clever tactique uh, um, and, and so on. Um, in, in Idris and Agda, it's a little bit more delicate, but um, you, you can do it. Um, in Agda, currently, it's a bit easier because because of the, all the Italos that they have. And this Question. is what Guillaume's paper is about. Yes, go on. So could you just explain this a little bit of Agda in the middle where you have the x1 equals y1? This one? Yeah. Okay. So now if you look at the next line, mm -hmm. equals y2. Yeah. How does yep. that know that the types of x2 and y2 are equal? Um, so this is a heterogeneous equality. So in order to give this, there's going to have to be a, um, a proof somewhere that they are equal. Sorry, I meant Idris, not Agda. Yeah. How does Idris know that x2 yeah, yeah, know. and y2? Because manifest uh, No, no, it, it, it does not. This is heterogeneous equality. Again? So it's oh, heterogeneous okay. equality. It doesn't, it, it doesn't know it here, but by this point it does. Wait, but I mean, in order for x2, in order for the type x2 wiggly equal wiggly y, in order for that type to yes. make sense, which I'm assuming that's the identity type, or is it something else? Is it heterogeneous, heterogeneous equality, yeah. It's heterogeneous equality. Ah, okay. So yes. heterogeneous equality, then okay, yeah. I mean, I have to do showing play sets. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. But, uh, okay, it takes two types and a yeah. If it's the identity type, then it's the question will be, uh, oh, okay, so it's A and B. Okay, so it's, yeah, it's a heterogeneous equality. Okay, that answers the question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's what the tilde means. And, and Idris, if you write this, that's homogeneous equality. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other question? Yeah, you can see why this is down the rabbit hole, right? Because, uh, you know, that, that's why it's after the break. Okay, but... Um, um, yeah, so I have written an Enery an, an version of, 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 of Kong based on, on Guillaume's paper. Uh, in Idris, you have to give the telescope as well because of the way it's structured. We not, I don't think currently without changing the Idris's type checker, we can infer the telescope. It's not clear that what I have in Agda can infer the telescope either uh, too well, but, but you can get some things out. Um, but again, yeah, work in progress. I, I would still consider it bad, um, but there's stuff I can do about it. Okay, um, now there's a whole bunch of ugly things. Okay, so, so the first ugly thing, Okay, is that folding is really noisy. And that's because even though we've known about folding for a long while, we haven't really been programming with it too much, I think. Um, not the way you, 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 you're going to have to do it at this level. And so, so there's a whole bunch of things that should be uh, 
that we can have. So we we've reached some kind of a local maximum, I think, in terms of the style of programming that's that's really sleek. And I think there's a few things we can do to make programming folding not suck as badly as it does currently. Okay, so so here's one way, one reason where where, where it sucks. We want to write things like uh, num x carrying a bit, uh, carrying a bit x, and num y carrying a bit y. We can't have that because we need all kinds of extra stuff for, for the proof. So we have to move the infix constructor to the left, and then introduce a whole bunch of implicit variables. And, and then you know the, the actual values we, we can be matching on what we care about get hidden in the middle. Again, and when I was presenting the the, the, the Frex in action earlier, I was trying to rearrange them a bit, and I think you, we can actually do a whole lot better uh, than that. We, we write something like this is not proper address. Um, Namex carrying car carex, and then there's a whole bunch of implicit stuff uh, happening that we want we need to kind of bring into scope to use, but uh, and, and and should go somewhere in the middle of carrying, but. Uh, you know, Idris can walk out because these things have names. Uh, w w what goes where? Okay, and then actually, there's a there's a pull request for Idris, uh, including record notation. So so it's kind of unifies function application with record notation that makes it a, that, that that makes something like this a, a lot closer to being within reach. It's not this is not proper Idris. We might be able to do that one day. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of people with better taste than me that I would want to run this by. But uh, I think something like this is within reach without too much extra work once that pull request is in. Okay, and and, and um, again, in each system, you you know, you might be able to do um, things uh, um, differently. Okay, this is very Idris specific. Any question about this slide? This is just just syntax. Okay, but but if you if you're gonna use folding, uh, you know, in anger, uh, something like this, I, I don't see how you could avoid it. Uh, um, but of course, there might be. Okay. <clears throat> Next, um, let's uncomment this bit. Okay, I'm not running anything. Ooh, crap. Sorry. So we've used auto implicits, okay? So you know instance variables in Agda and so on, uh, which means that Idris can try to stick in the raffle uh, for those proofs by itself and see if that if that makes sense. This doesn't happen on, on, on pattern matching at all, um, and and so you when you you end up telling Idris, um, I have a bit vector. The first component is bit. The second component is bits. But also in this case, it's safe for you to. Uh, to do the, the, the unification between uh, va the, of the forward va value. So that means that the return value uh, really should unify with one plus uh, the width, for example, or, 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 or uh, um, the previous value plus two times, whatever. That's because we want to easily eliminate a whole bunch of, of, of unification variables that, 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 um, that it, it's safe to eliminate. So this is a, a bit half baked, uh, and, and I had a very good conversation with James McKenna about this. So, so I don't think this idea is is particularly novel to me, uh, but I'm just encouraging people who know a lot better than me about pushing something like this through because it would make it's a general. So it's, what I'm going to describe now is a general kind of recipe um, that would also solve this. Right? I, don't, I don't want to just solve folding. That, that that's that's nice, but niche. I want to kind of have a better type theory out there. And it touches on other issues. Okay, so and 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 what what I'm proposing or suggesting is that there really is two two roles that data declarations or GEDs or type families um, um, serve, right? When you're writing in Idris data something, uh, it, it it does two different two very different things. And people, you know, I'm, I'm picking this up from uh, Patty Yon and Neil Gani from 2008, and they have a Patty has an, has a newer version of this, but <clears throat> James tells me that this is an old idea that's been tried in different different places. I'm not sure it was tried exactly like this. And, and, and if it has, I want to know what the lessons were. Okay, so the first function, functionality of, of GDTs, is to allow you to do inductive types, right? Kind of recursion. And this is not the most general form of recursion. This is something like rows trees. <clears throat> uh, so I'm indexing by by uh, uh, a type type level function, f from type to type, and a value in a type A, and then a node in a rows tree is for each of those values. It's a, it's a, it's an element of the type A, and then uh, um, the shape 
of the predecessor is based on this, this type of a function f. So it can change the shape of the tree nodes can change as you, as you go through the tree. Okay, <clears throat> and and the point about uh, about the first functionality of, of their declarations is that this is recursive. I can refer to to the G rows in it, and I can also change the, the you know I can change the um, index as I go along. That's fine. Okay, that will work fine, um, and I would get a, 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 a fine um, inductive definition. Okay, the second. So, so yeah, if, if you're doing initial algebra semantics, this is kind of the initial algebra functionality of data type declarations. <clears throat> the second one has to do with extending um, and, um, the indices from the ones you enumerate in each constructor to all possible indices, right? So if we're looking at, at, at say, heterogeneous equality, which I'm, I'm studying out here, right? It has four, four indices, a type, and a value of that type, another type, and a value of that type, but we're really only just looking at uh, um, there's only one constructor, and that makes everything equal. Okay, and 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 um, and what the data type declaration does, right? It, it lets you uh, uh, change the indexing from just this this pair into all possible uh, um, quadruples. Okay, so that whenever you kind of define a function out of it, it's enough for you to to to, to case split on all the on all the um, on all the constructors. Okay, and, and only look at, at, at the telescopes. Uh, yeah, for them. Okay, so so what I'm proposing, I mean, I think it's quite vanilla, and James tells me that people have considered things to that effect, um, but uh, I'm not sure whether they were considered quite in this way, um, apart from this this line of work, and you know the related work there, <clears throat> which is um, if you separate inductive types from, you know, you can call it these can extensions, you can call these. Uh, 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 Type families. I'm not, I'm not sure what the, what the right term for this. Um, then, whenever you have one of one of those things, right, one of those kind of extensions, uh, on on the pattern side, the type checker can can try to eta expand um, according to the according to the extension. Whenever it, it can work out, there's only one possible constructor. So, kind of eagerly eta expanding. Okay. So, Agda already does it for record types because a record you can think of it as a single constructor data declaration. And, 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 and Agda would either expand records uh, along that single constructor. But you can say, well, what's special about records? Why just do it for records? Uh, try to do it for any data declaration. What's really stopping you from doing it is this recursive, the potentially recursive function that uh, data type declarations serve. Right? But for, say, um, heterogeneous equality, if you can see that, you, that it's safe to unify, why, 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 why won't you? Why not? OK. So, so, uh, so that's a general kind of solu potential solution or potential proposal uh, for for dealing with this ugly bit. And, and again, I'm not, I'm, I'm really not thinking I came up with this. I just don't know where to read more about it. So, so if someone can point me at uh, at lessons learned, uh, I will be very, very grateful. But of course, I, uh, the way these things usually find out is that I do the legwork and, and, and read everything. But uh, I'm happy to to be helped there. Okay. Any question about this slide? Okay. Ooh, okay. Um, I only have four ugly things, so I'm just gonna mm, don't want to talk about this one. Well, okay. Very quickly, something like Agda or Idris or Haskell, they have this mechanism called type classes that you overload notation. Okay, the problem is that it lets you overload specific notation for specific algebra, but when you're working for algebra generically, it just struggles. And it struggles for multiple reasons. So one of them is kind of generating those interfaces, those, that notation. In Agla, you're not allowed to overload, as far as I know. So what you have to do is, is have this kind of very sophisticated mechanism for renaming uh, your operations all the time, which is nice on the one hand, but on the other hand, you kind of have this kind of cold duplication, this boilerplate of every time I'm using monoid, two different monoids, I'm renaming everything all the time, okay? Which is uh, uh, tedious and annoying. And specifically, you know, type classes, um, Haskell goes to great length to making sure that uh, um, type class instances are uniquely determined by the type, right? So, so once I know A, uh, I know there is a unique monoid structure on A. That's just not true. If I, you know, there's multiple monoid structures on the natural numbers. 
Okay, I want to work with all of them and I want a nice way to, to, to deal with them. And in, in Haskell, you can get away with it because you don't actually have to do reasoning. So you can do some new type and smart constructors uh, so that you can program in kind of a tedious way, but at runtime, none of this happens. But the moment you have to start boxing and unboxing, it becomes it just becomes impossible. I've, I've, I've done this, okay? I've had an iteration of Frex when I was trying to do that, and it just doesn't, doesn't fly, okay? So, so again, this looks like an engineering problem, but to me, it feels like there's a missing abstraction here, right? Something, something about type classes or overloading notation. So kind of the, the title is types with structure, right? We need to be able to program with types with structure in better ways. And, 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 and I have some ideas but there, but, but I'm more, it's more important for me to flag this as a problem. Uh, than, than to to really have a killer killer solution. Um, yeah, just very quickly, Frexifying is very tedious still, right? So this is, I don't know, really, I'm happy to write this now, but I really would rather not write this, right? So I don't want to be able, I don't want to have to specify what equation uh, I'm trying to solve. I don't want to specify the environment. Ideally, Idris or Agda or Koch could, could somehow extract that from the proof obligation. In general, it's going to be difficult because we're going to have things like mod2 thing to not start. The thing to extract is 0 plus start. I don't see how that can happen automatically. But in many cases, it, you know, the, the proof obligation, the, the constraint the type checker has actually is quite close to an algebraic term. So, so some support for that um, would be nice. No, I'm not asking for modular implicits, Andre, because uh, they still don't cut it. Uh, so, so um, as far as I can tell. But uh, you know, Jeremy Yallop is also a collaborator on this for a reason, and, and you know, we are discussing this. So, 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 um, yeah. So, so we, you know, the, the partial evaluation frex, the, the work we've, we've done before. We have two implementation: one in Okamo, one in Haskell. The one in Okamo does use uh, in, um, modules and modular implicits. The Haskell one is still sleeker, so 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 I think there's still there's still more work to do even with modular implicits, and maybe Jeremy would be kicking me for saying this later, but but uh, um, um, it's for me it's not a solved problem yet, but but yeah it's it's another step. Okay, the the point about about uh, uh, you know type classes and, and and virus encoding of it is really. What you're overloading is not coherent, right? I'm going to have very different implementations for the same operations, and that's fine. Okay, I, I have to be able to do that. Uh, it's just that in the context I, I am, I need to be able to disambiguate which operations I'm meaning. Okay, and and um, yeah, modular implicit gives you a little bit of that. I have to do a bit more experimentation with that. Idris doesn't have modular implicit, so I don't really, I can't really program like that. But uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. Sorry. Okay, so so to summarize, because I'm out of time. Um, okay, what I want to do is to, to enable kind of exploratory dependent type programming. I don't know what the indexes would look like. I need to write my whole program in order to know that. So I should be able to finish my program. Okay, because you know programming is exploratory, right? Um, and we're trying to mitigate it. Um, um, we're trying to mitigate programming with non-free and non-inductive indices, right? indexing by computations. And we use these two ingredients. One of them is very old, um, folding, so how to kind of improve the conversation with a type checker. And the other one is a bit newer, is, is programming with free extensions, okay, which is a sound and complete. So the point is this completeness specification for, for the Frexes. I know that Frex solves exactly all the equations from the universal property, right? This, uh, the, the theory equations together with the evaluation equations. It's not an arbitrary solver. I know exactly what it solves. I know exactly what it's good for. Okay, so, so that's you know one concrete delta with existing work on solvers. Um, we can't only support uh, community monoids and partially support semi-ring. I'm still working on that. But, uh, uh, you know, watch this space is going to be more. This is still work in progress. We've used two use cases to evaluating it in the in integer library, a primitive integer library, and, and, and not index speed vectors. And they kind of make surface a whole bunch of stuff uh, that we still want to address. Uh, some of it is, is more syntactic, some of it is more uh, engineering in flavor, and one of, some of them are, 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 are I, I think, well, feel more the core type theory or dependent types uh, uh, 
flavor, but uh, I'm not saying it's deep dependent types, it just feels more like fundamental research in the independent types. Um, and that's it, I'll stop here. Uh, we can take questions. I'm, I'm, the, I'm past the end of the slot now, so so I'm happy also not to take questions if you, if you want to go for lunch. Okay, thank you. Virtual clap. Questions? I thought you don't clap in Slovenia. Oh, no, we changed that because once, uh, many years ago, Gordon Blotkin uh, spoke in his seminar and it seemed odd that we wouldn't clap. So ever since Gordon gave that talk, we clap. Okay, yeah, that's a, he's a worthy person to change the tradition for. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some questions on the chat. Egbert, do you want to read it out, or shall I, shall I just... Egbert, uh, the uh, video recording is not going to have the chat, so maybe just uh, talk things out. Uh, yeah, yeah I, can, I can ask my question uh, uh, in person also. Uh, so I was wondering about that uh, type uh, EQAXBY that you defined just two or three slides earlier. The heterogeneous equality, yes. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not quite a heterogeneous equality. It's just yes. weird so, indexed egg type, uh, yes. Um, so I was asking, is it equivalent to the type of uh, pairs that consist of an identification uh, from A to B? I'm assuming that A and B are in the same universe level, if, if Idris has that. And then Q must be a heterogeneous equality from X to Y over P. Is that the way? I so you're saying you would first provide a proof that the types are equal and then once you know that the types are equal then you can compare the elements yeah so, so, so if i'm not wrong in agda this is a produce equality right um so what's in the standard library so so you have a parameter type and a parameter x and then uh, uh, you, you have, have an one. index type b yeah but you have one arrow too many right there in front of X. I mean, yeah, you have to change the arrows. Yeah. You have to change the arrows. So you, you drop yeah. the arrow. Yes. Okay. Um, and and then you, you can drop you can drop this hobbit. Is is this is this is this your question? Uh, why did not do it like that? Uh, no, my question is not. It's just to characterize this equality. And uh, so, is it not the case that from this uh, equality you can? Uh, Prove also an equality A equals B if you can prove uh, that X equals Y. Yes. Yeah, 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 it's correct. You can. I mean, this is this is one reason why. Sorry. Oh, I see what you're saying now. Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, heterogeneous. This kind of heterogeneous equality is very different from you know the one you have with I dimensions, right? So, so where you only get some some. Uh, um, you might want to have some equivalences between A and B that are not. Is this what you mean? Um, I'm trying to... It, it's very truncated kind of equality. Um, yeah, but it, so I, it, it doesn't need to be. Um, but but, but uh, no, I, I, I think I can, uh, I can see that the characterization that I have in it, that should be correct. So, so maybe uh, you know another uh, an undercurrent here, right? Is because I'm working in Indonesia and because I had K floating about, um, um, that, that makes a whole bunch of stuff transparent that, that you might want to be to be yeah. so able to see. Um, another but, way to but, say it, is um, it should be equality in the uh, in the total space of the universe, sigma x in u x. So it's equality there, it seems. What is so what do you want to write? Um, so it is. Uh, so if if we have x um, uh, gives an identification a x equals b e y. So I put it in the chat again. Yes, you can you can write this kind of function. So so you, you can write a function from x uh, x y to uh, to uh, a x uh, equals uh, a y. Yeah, and, and this uh, this map actually should be an isomorphism or an equivalence. Yeah, I would be surprised. Uh, yes. A x b y, not a x. Yes. 
Uh, thanks. Yeah, and I will probably I will probably do it like this. Otherwise, you just will complain about about it, or we'll make it again heterogeneous. But, but yes, um, but that's kind of to me. That's uh, I'm not I'm not very sensitive to this question. To, to me, I'm, you know, that's the the tr truncating at high at high dimensions is 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 is, is the, the Is the norm, uh, so so I'm just yeah. yeah um, it gives me a way to think about this EQ. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, part of it is, is talking to people I don't usually talk to. So yeah, so maybe a whole a whole um, a whole uh, uh, introduction to this is that I'm very far from my usual stomping grounds. Um, so so I'm going to be maybe using the wrong terms or, or, or not, you know, going to going to be. Uh, 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 it's gonna. It's a bit challenging for me to 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 to, to kind of speak the right words, but but uh, I'm learning and I'm happy to learn more. So thanks for that. Okay, it's getting pretty late, so unless there is an urgent question, let's conclude here. Thanks, Ohad. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. My everyone. pleasure. Bye bye. <clears throat> bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Oh wow, Donovan is still here. It must be really late for him. Where's he at? Uh, just Australia. just after nine p.m. Ohad. Oh, so just, is it? Just after nine o'clock. So not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. Okay, okay. I thought it was later. Uh, but cheers. I thought it was a good talk. Uh, I have a few things that I'll ask you about uh, later. I'm sure. Happy to anyone as well. You, you know, you, hopefully you know how to find me. And if you don't, just send me an email. You know, I hope I hope you find me. Okay, bye guys. Bye bye. Thanks, Andre. I hope that was okay bye. for you. Yeah, yeah it was good. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, there was no machine learning. No, we can always claim there was machine learning. Well, this is all because I want to do machine learning. I'm, I'm not joking. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, of course, machine learners don't will not be able to see at this point what it has to do with machine learning. Of course, some some do, um, but but you, you, they're very few and far between. So they're very few and very far between. Uh, but okay, if, well, if you know where to find them, um, that's good. Okay. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Now close down the meeting. Bye, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care.